Good. It's good to see you too. Good to see you. Uh, Nicole sent me a note a couple of weeks ago. I don't know when it was. And she said, hey, would you introduce the, the, the speakers on Monday night? I said, sure, I'd love to. I said, That's just, she says, you got two or three minutes. Just introduce them and get off the stage. Something like that. I can't remember what it was. No. And I said, no, for such an introduction, I need 30 minutes, bubbly in the green room, and a hand towel when I walk off. And I said, and if you can't do that, I'll still do it anyway. So we're good. But, you know, this is, uh, th- this, these types of gatherings, this is the way I think about this. This is the congregations of the friends of Jesus. We're all friends of Jesus. That's what he calls us. He calls us his friends, and we congregate like this. That's the church. The church is the congregation of the friends of Jesus. And that's what we're doing this week. We're here to encourage one another, love on one another, pray for each other, and stand with each other. And, you know, tonight... Uh, I, I want to just present uh, Jay and Danielle in a way that I, I was just thinking what they have stepped into. I'm not amazed by this couple of, because of the last year and a half, because they've been doing it for decades. It's the real deal. And to do it, God has given them abundant wisdom. Wisdom. They've gathered an amazing team who are helping shepherd this thing into the future. That's wisdom. Because they, 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 they really have a team. And I feel so peaceful knowing that team and are going to lead us and that, those, that couple is leading that team. That's wisdom. Courage, because Jay has already proven that he is willing to tackle some really hard stuff that most of us run from including myself. But what really impresses me about Jay and Danielle is I've always experienced them in kindness. So, you know, I th- I, I'm, exci- I'm so excited about the future, I can't wait to go to bed and wake up tomorrow. <laughs> because I think we're being well-led. I think we've got a great future. I think God got us this far, and he'll get us on. So tonight, would you give it up for our national director... Jay and Danielle Pathak. Thank you. Hey Good evening. So, uh, we're just starting, and uh, it feels pretty good. We, we get, can, can you, do you have enough stamina to do this for a whole week? I mean, are we, yeah, oh, well, one guy, woo, okay. It's the guy that was wiggling. Yeah, I was the wiggly corner. guy, okay, good, well, <laughs> that's good. Um, so this is called uh, Making All Things New, so I thought it would be important to read what is true. This is not a hope. This is not a wish. This is a certainty. And all who are the friends of Jesus will see this. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first earth And heaven passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people. He will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them, and they will be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. These are trustworthy words, and they are certain. And yet, uh, 
That isn't the world we live in presently, is it? So from now until then, we got some things to do. (laughs) From now until then, there's things to do. God is on mission. And that future that we know is certain is breaking backward into this age. And it is coming through the people of God and the church of Jesus Christ and the mission that we have joined into. Well, that you and I together, we've joined into. This is what we wanna talk about through this week. These are the things we wanna talk about. These, how, how are we actually doing that? And how do we stay motivated in that vision, in that mission? Um, I don't know about you, it can, it can get... It can get to where you get disillusioned. Uh, I mean, it doesn't always feel like you're winning, does it? Some of you are like, does it ever feel like I'm winning? Yeah. <laughs> and, and I know uh, in a room this size, you know, there, there, we come in here with all kinds of different things. There's some of you that maybe it doesn't show on your face, maybe... Maybe it doesn't come out when you greet one another, but you're, you're hanging on by a thread. I mean, you barely got here. And you're wondering, can I keep doing this? There's others of you that are like, I, you know, I've been to 30, some of these. I could probably do another one, I guess. And I get to see some friends, that's cool. And I'll tolerate the sessions. <laughs> if I must. But <laughs> do you see how that laugh was a little more muted? It was a little, uh, it's like, how does he know? And, and, and there's other of you that you're, you're flying, you're on fire, you, you're, you're beyond motivated. You could not be more excited. There is, everything's happening the way you want it to happen. And uh, you just wait. That's kind of the nature of our talk tonight is, uh, is how, how do we build longevity and resilience in this thing that's called the mission of God in our lives? We've joined something bigger than ourselves and it's easy to become disillusioned because it doesn't always work. It doesn't go the way we think it's going to go. And how do we be resilient? Uh, And and the different modes and the worlds that we move through in order to do this through till the end. And not just manage it, but thrive and grow and remain inspired by this one who's captured us, Jesus himself. So uh, do you wanna tell them what we're gonna do? I will. Okay. Everybody here, has been given a gift. And the gift is that you have been invited to be a part of the mission of God. And I feel very impressed, I'm just gonna pause just for a moment, that every single person in this room, you have it, you know it, you might have to remember it maybe over the course of these next few days. And there's kids that are sitting in other buildings that are receiving that this week. And so I actually would love to take just a moment before we move on, we start talking about mission and calling and that sort of thing and how it affects us in our stage of life and pray for them. Is that okay? Okay, yeah. okay. Because I've already been talking to a lot of parents and we are holding a lot of anticipation in our hearts. Yeah. So join with me, everybody, okay? <laughs> so Lord Jesus, would you come and would you fill those spaces, the outside spaces, the inside spaces, the zip line, the, the, the dressing, I mean, like what, whatever the kids' uh, activities are, would you come and fill those spaces? Grab their hearts, Lord. Grab their hearts, Lord Jesus. Invite them into something so much bigger than they have imagination for. Do it in that age that they are. Like, let them not be something that they're trying to grasp, uh, something that's too weighty for them, but that you enter into the five-year-old's heart and the 13-year-old's heart and the 17-year-old's heart and push past all the defenses and all the bravado and all the all this stuff, Lord Jesus, and would you woo them to you? Yeah. So come, Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you. So everybody here, we've been invited into the mission of God. 
And our understanding of what that looks like and our, our kind of like comprehension, the way that we pick up confidence like over the years, well, that can be dramatically affected, right? And oftentimes it's dramatically affected by the world around us because we know that with every generation, it changes, right? It, or it can change, it can affect us. We know that with a crisis that happens in the world that all, the t all of a sudden it can shake everything around us to where we look at that mission that we felt so confident about five minutes ago and then all of a sudden it's like, I don't really know, right? Different political cycles, different health scares, they all affect us. But tonight, what we're gonna do is not talk about the external, and we're not gonna talk about how the world affects our calling. We're literally going to concentrate on us, on the way that we're made, the intricate ways that God takes us through seasons and different se like seasons and stages of our life. And the way that we understand our calling, it actually has to adjust. It just has to. We have to have a fluidity to it and an open-handedness to it because the way that we understand calling in, in the stage five years ago is very different from the stages that we are entering into, right? Does that make sense to you? So we are gonna be challenging you um, in, in, in probably a hundred different ways. We live right now in a culture, as we look around the room, we live in a culture that, that really doesn't understand aging, does it? I mean, we really don't. Like, we worship the young. We worship, like, this kind of younger, younger stage where we have vitality and energy and, and hair that doesn't need to be dyed. And, I mean, all the stuff, right? I mean, seriously. Botox, and, and what's yeah. interesting, exactly, Botox and injections and that sort of thing. But it's really worthwhile to pause and recognize that pretty much throughout the entire world for all of time, that it has not been that way. That it's been, that, that we've had culture that has respected the old. <laughs> respected as you get older. Respected the gray hair. Respected you in such a way that you were given places of honor, right? In the different villages, in the homes. And, and I, I just think how, how different that is now, right? To where we build homes literally to tuck away the old. You know, to pretend like we can't see that things decline over time. Mm -hmm. Well, Tonight, what we're going to do in the next several minutes is talk about lifespan. And we're going to talk about just a framework that could be helpful for you where you are at. Um, many people will break up your lifespan into different decades, right? You know, maybe your 20s, your 30s, your 40s, and so on. Or maybe different halves of life, you know, to where, oh, this is what God's doing in the first half or the second half. Well, what we're going to do, we would like to present that it could be thirds. And even as we talk about the thirds, right, like it's, it's, it's fluid, right? Like first 25, second 25, third 25. And listen, if you just get beyond that, Fingers it is lost, bonus. Yeah. It is bonus. You are hashtag winning, Okay. I'm sure you are. You are winning, okay? You can just be, I don't even know. It's like special, okay? But we're not necessarily, you can, be, yeah, I mean, exactly. On, so that first third, you know, Legalist. just play with that a little bit. You might find yourself identifying in different life stages, but we're going to do that. And it's funny because when Jay and I were preparing, I mean, obviously we're thinking about our own age. And, well, and, we were trying not to. <laughs> well, we were trying not to actually, okay? You were a little bit more confident in saying that you were actually ending our second our second stage, Well, I was confident because right? that's the 25. It's, the, it, it's 50, well, Danielle. Well, exactly. But I was having an issue with that. So we're, he... he w <laughs> We're near 50, dear. I know that. Okay. But I... It's a, it's a number. Yeah. Okay. okay. Well, you know, I it's mean... It's not like a calculation. Mid-40s, okay? Mid-40s, you guys. <laughs> now, some of you are looking at us going, that's so old. That's so old. Some of you guys are looking at us going, that's so young. You know, I mean, we understand. It's like all over the place. We're very aware. We're having lots of conversations about glasses lately. Some are lately. saying, really? Really? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. In both ways. Oh, okay. 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 <laughs> <laughs> what we're gonna I mean do, me, I mean me. Of yeah, course. exactly. You, of course. You, yeah, you, you're getting gray. Yeah, you're getting gray. Um, I'm not above a little die, so we're good. We're good. 
We'll get back to that. Yeah, we'll get back to that. So tonight, what we're going to do, we're going to examine the life of Joseph, okay? And we're going to look at these thirds, these first 25, second 25, and then this later part of life. And we're just going to look at the different lessons and the different formational moments that Joseph went through because every stage has formational invitations. It just does. I remember a dear pastor, when I was a young girl, he said from a stage, um, he just said, listen, like your first, this first third, full of character tests. The second third, you just kind of get into it, you know, and then I'm, I'm already giving it away. Yeah, and don't I'm, give the sermon Oh, away. don't give it away. But what was interesting about that moment, what was interesting about that moment is that I had never thought that way. I literally had never thought that way. Like it was one of those things where I just thought, you just live, you just live, like you just kind of go through things and whatever. It could be tonight that the God kind of opens up your mind to make you realize, or to at least invite you to realize that there's very formational moments that are happening in your stage. And if you are brave enough, you will step into those formational moments because they build upon each other. So very first stage, Joseph, let's just dig right in. We're gonna read a lot of scripture. We're gonna sum up a lot of this story. But first third, Joseph, we think it's about 17 years old that we enter into this really cool story of Joseph and his brothers, right? And what's interesting about Joseph is that we actually do get a lot of his lifespan, which is interesting. So 17 years old is rather young. Let's go ahead and read about this first third, which would be vision and dreaming. Now, Israel loved Joseph more than any of his sons because he had been born to him in his old age, and he made an ornate robe for him. When his brothers saw that their father loved him more than any of them, they hated him, and they could not speak a kind word to him. Joseph had a dream, and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him all the more. He said to them, listen to this dream I had. We were binding sheaves of grain out in the field when suddenly my sheaf rose and stood upright while your sheaves gathered round mine, and they bowed down to it. His brothers said to him, do you intend to reign over us? Will you actually rule us? And they hated him all the more because of his dream and what he had said. Then he had another dream, and he said to his brothers, listen, he said, I had another dream, and this time the sun and the moon and the 11 stars were bowing down to me. When he told his father as well as his brothers, his father rebuked him and said, what is this dream you had? Will your mother and I and your brothers actually come and bow down to the ground before you? His brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the matter in mind. Now, Joseph is so excited about what is happening to him, right? <laughs> he's having dreams, he's having visions. And, 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 he, and no matter how you're actually interacting with the story, no matter how you're kind of reading the story, he could be either overly kind of naive, right? Like just kind of naive and just like a little bit ignorant, or he could be all the way on the other side and he could be just brash. I mean, he is a younger brother, right? So, I mean, he could be one of those things where he's looking at his older brothers going, ha, 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 like I've had a big dream. You don't have dreams. Like, I'm going to tell you, I think maybe I know what it means. I mean, like you could read it a couple different ways. All we know is that he did not realize the impact of what he was saying, right? Like he was young, he was excited. This stage is full of not understanding your impact. It is full of of, of being brave and courageous and having big, big, big dreams. Have you ever, if you are in this stage right now, have you ever, and you might even be thinking if you're not in the stage, back to a stage where you were like this, but have you ever been describing a big dream, something that was really exciting to you, something that maybe you wanted money for, or you wanted support for, or you wanted somebody to buy in, and you're watching somebody's expression, and they're just not buying it, and they're just not feeling as excited as you are about the thing that you are excited about, or right? Or feeling threatened. Right? right? Or maybe it's kind of threatening, and you're going, well, I don't understand what's yeah. happening. I have no idea. This is so, so, so strange, Right? Like, it's a very, very disorienting feeling. Or maybe you're in this stage right now, and you're burning. You're going, yes, the Lord is putting big dreams in me. I don't know how it's going to happen, but I 
know the Lord is going to use me in this mission of God. Jay and I have the funniest story. So when we were church planning 22 years ago, we were tasked with, or actually maybe we just kind of came up with this, that we were going to make a video. I don't think anybody asked Okay, us well, to. maybe, yeah, 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 yeah. This is like our grand it's, it's idea, okay? It's a way okay? better story that if someone asked us knew, to. knew, knew, knew that God wanted us to go start this little church in Colorado. So in part of our, like part of our enthusiasm, we were like, we're going to make a video and it's going to be the best video of all time. And we are, yeah, yeah. yeah. And we are going to, I mean, we're going to travel to this place that we're going to be at and we're going to take still video. I mean, we're yeah. just video Black pictures and, and we're going to interview people on the team that, yeah. Enya. <laughs> no, no, no. There was no Enya. There was a no, little. No, no. There no, was. was. There was Enya? a section. Was yeah. there Enya? Yes. Okay. I love Denya. I'm it was sorry. Like flickering. I loved raining. it. I probably had a say in it. Okay. So anyway, so we made this. Cool. We made this incredible so video. Cool. So we Gen are X. feeling confident, like confident. Okay. I mean, we are showing it to everybody. I think it literally was played on the stage yeah. as we are being prayed out of this church. Okay. To be able to go prayed out. That was funny. I mean, as we were being sent out. By then, it yeah. It could have been. It's probably true. I think you said it right. <laughs> <laughs> Rich isn't here. He wouldn't be able to yeah, sound like it. So anyways, as we were being sent out of this church, this big video is being played and we are so proud and excited. And I'm like, oh, I, you guys, in all vulnerability and all honesty, I'm going to tell you exactly what we said in this video. And I swear, if, I swear, if you dig up this, this video. This is just okay. parts of what we said. Okay. Yeah. This, is, this is literally what Jay said. Okay. <laughs> He that, said, we can start he there. said, if you have the cure for cancer, you're not just lazy or cowardly if you don't share it. You're evil. <laughs> he literally called people evil. I mean, it's pretty evil. strong logic. Okay, now. For what it's worth. Moment, I mean, I think it holds up. It is. Now, in the moment, it's not super thoughtful. sounds amazing. Sounds really intense. 15, 20 years later, well, hold on, we hold are on. Well, I didn't say your part. Oh. Dan Danielle says, because we're interviewing different people from the team, Danielle says, it, you know, there's people there and they're just waiting for us. It was so arrogant. You just think about like, there's already churches there, right? You know, like, 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 you know, we've not known what to do. We've been wondering. <laughs> Who will come from the Midwest <laughs> to the pagan wilderness of Denver <laughs> and save us? Mortifying. Like, absolutely it's mortifying. Shocking. It, yes. is, it is it's humiliating. shocking, yes. <laughs> However, and I mean this, seriously, uh, it's important you have dreams. Yes. Like, listen, I want you to hear me. Those of you who, who are in the like that, that, that third, maybe 25 and under, let's even say 30, we'll round up. 30 and under in the room. Okay. Yep. Listen, I, I, I want to speak really directly to you for a second, okay? If you don't have a big dream, you should get one. You should ask God for one. You really should. I mean, listen, you, you can take risks right now that'll be harder to take later. It's true. Right. You can do things right now that will, you can still do them later, but it'll change. And you should take those risks. And you need to be around people that encourage you to take those risks. And I, I think about all the things that we did, you know, like, 24-hour, 48-hour prayer meetings mm -hmm. and, you know, bringing homeless people into like this house. I was with all these other dudes and, and you're just like sleeping in this house because, you know, we're serving the poor. We'd go out in the middle of the night. We'd mm -hmm. like cast demons out of people. At least that's what we thought we were doing. Because listen, mm -hmm. we read in the Bible, we were going to try it. And I remember coming and being with like, you know, Rich Nathan, different people on the Columbus Virginia staff. And they would be like, there's a homeless person in your house now? Sleeping like on a right couch. now, I'm like, yeah, yeah. you yeah. know. And then you go home, and they stole half of it. It's all at a thrift <laughs> store, and then you you find them, and they're like, "I'm so sorry." And you're like, "Yeah, it's okay. Come on back." You know, <laughs> what, what? Guys, it's right? true. No, no, it's listen, true. Here's, here's why this is it's funny. True. There are a few of you younger in the room going, "Yeah." Here's what I'm going to tell you, and you got to take your risks. 
You need a big dream. Uh, and in this week, you should ask God for that. I mean, God put a hook in us in those years. This part can make me emotional. Like mm -hmm. things happen in rooms like this that we're living out to this day. We took risks that changed our life yeah. in that era. You, you need big dreams, but listen, those of us get a little older, we're like, hmm, I was a little naive, but do not despise the dreams of the youth. Let, let, them, let them dream, let them pray, let them take risks. Encourage them, bless them to do that. We need that kind of energy. We need that kind of fervor. We need that vision in the life of our movement. And because here's the deal, I, I know what happens. You know, I, I remember even being that age and people grabbed me and saying like, yeah, well, sure, Jay, go for it. That's great, you'll see. <laughs> and I didn't really know what they meant, but here's the truth. Young folks, they don't need you to humble them. God will do it. <laughs> Those of you a little younger in the room, did you hear how loud that laugh was? Did you hear, it was like a, <laughs> it erupted. <laughs> That's so true. Okay. Because it's true. But it also means that like, you don't have to do that work for God. They need people to support them and strengthen them equip them, empower them, and be there when they hit those challenges. Because what we watch in Joseph, you know the story. I'm, I'm in a room full of preachers. You know the story. You know what happens. This great dream, this vision, which by the way, it turns out was from God in the end. Okay, like the fact that everything starts to go wrong doesn't mean it wasn't from God. That gets confirmed later. But Joseph has to find a way to be faithful throughout because for most, and you know, the old mystics and great saints would tell us that that second third is really about building, but overcoming. There is a cost to pay because God loves you too much. Uh, he's going to humble you. He's going to do things in your life to deal with whatever's going on on the inside so that you can be used more fully for his kingdom. And that second third we see happen to Joseph pretty much instantly. Uh, you know the story. I, 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 we're not gonna be able to read all the different passages, but what happens next? His brothers are so irritated that they decide, you know what? We gotta kill this guy. This is crazy. If he does another dream, I'm not gonna be able to take it. And so like, we're gonna kill him. And one of the brothers steps up and says, no, 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 we can't kill him. Don't kill him. Like, the, I think we'd be under a curse if we kill him. We could probably sell him to slavery. <laughs> we'll be fine. So they take his beautiful coat of many colors. You know the story. They soak it in blood and they sell him into slavery. Now, I just want you to just, if you just pause there for a moment, it's difficult to fathom the depth and the scope of that kind of a betrayal. I mean, honestly, like we read it like it's just a Bible story, but like, just think about that a second. That level of betrayal, your older brothers. I mean, in any culture, but definitely this one, they're the ones that are tasked to care for him, train him, teach him, lead him, protect him. And they're the ones that betray him like this. And the next thing you know, he's sold into slavery. I don't know. I mean, I would love for someone to tell me I'm wrong. I have never known a leader who pursues the mission of God in their life and in the world that has not experienced massive betrayal. If you know one, if you're here tonight, I would love to meet you. I don't know one. I don't know one that has not had someone who has looked them in the face and said, we're gonna do this for life. We're gonna do this for life together. You're my brother, you're my sister, you're my friend. I'll do whatever it takes to support you. I'm with you to the end. And have not had at least a few, not just drift away, not just sort of politely say, you know, I, I made a commitment. 
Not really sure I can keep up with that. But deep betrayal. The gossip behind their back. The attack of their character. Really seeking to harm, not just uh, to go and do something else. And right here, uh, right as I say it right now, I mean, listen, can you feel it in the room? I mean, mm-hmm. as I say it, there's some of you that are in it right now. This is the test you're in. I mean, how many of us in COVID experiences? Like you come back from COVID and the people you were like, man, these are my people, aren't your people. I mean, right now, some of you are still like, I don't know, like, should we call the police? Like a missing persons report? I mean, they are gone. Gone, gone. Anyone, right? I mean, if not just COVID, but more, more personal than that, this is a test. Can you be faithful to the call of God on your life anyway? The test is simply this. Um, who are you in this for? Who, who are you actually in this for? And betrayal tests that. You know, because subtly we often, we start to say, well, it is all for God. But something happens along the way where it drifts and now it's because of these people. And if I'm not with these people, then what's the point anyway? But it's a test. Can I be faithful Anyway, can I be faithful in that betrayal? Um, Rick Olmstead is here somewhere, uh, dear brother, friend. Uh, you know, there was one time Danielle and I were sitting with him as we were planting the church, and we'd had some really horrible stuff happen with leaders and our team and folks that said they were with us, and it was a mess. And I'll never forget him sitting across the table looking at us and going, hey, I'm gonna tell you something that you're probably not gonna wanna hear right now, but I think it's gonna help you. I said, sure. He said, the test for longevity in ministry is, can you trust again? Can you invest again? Can you trust again? That I know I gave my life to these people Mm -hmm. and they went away, but can you do it again? Can you turn around and as you're saying goodbye, can you say hello? And by the way, guys, he goes, I hate, and I remember thinking in that moment, like, probably one more time. It's hard. You know, it's like, hard. I remember thinking yeah. that, like, probably, I could probably do that one more time. Mm-hmm. And then he was like, because you're going to do it over and over and over and over. And you know why? Because it's not about you. Mm-hmm. And it's not even about these people. It's about the mission that God has called you to Listen, there's some of you like the sermon just ended. We're done. (laughs) Because you've not decided yet. Like right now you're going, I don't know. (laughs) That one hurt pretty bad. There's some of you are like, I don't know. I'm on, Jay, I'm on like rep 15. I don't know, I thought I had thick skin, but this last one, that one left a burn. That one's left a scar. Who are you in it for? Because you have to cross that bridge. You have to realize this is part of it. There's people right now in that first third, you're hearing me, right? That first third, you got all of it. Listen, there's gonna be some bridges you have to cross. There's some that are in that second and third, you're going, oh yeah, listen to this man. He's saying something. But there's some of you that are in the test right now. Okay, let's do another one. Let, we can keep moving. We could just end, I think. But let's, let's do, let's do a, a bit more. Because you would think, wow, that's really hard. Poor Joseph, end of story. Nope. Sold into slavery. Here's the thing, He's faithful. The scriptures are super, super clear. He is so faithful that the favor of God is upon him as a slave. Favor of God's on him because he's faithful, because he's serving God. He's gonna be the man he's called to be. It doesn't matter where he's at. It doesn't matter what circumstances. He's gonna be that man. And so he serves and there's favor on him. And then of course, you know the story, Potiphar's wife, 
He's working Potiphar. Potiphar's wife looks at him, and I love this little bit. I'll, I'll jump all the way down to verse six. It says, now Joseph was well built and handsome. <laughs> and after a while, I mean, listen, some of us are not well built and handsome. It can be a blessing. <laughs> and after a while, his masters, don't look at anybody right now. <laughs> don't look at anybody. It's very important you don't look at anybody. <laughs> and after a while, his master's wife took notice to Joseph and said, come to bed with me. But he refused. With me in charge, he told her, my master does not concern himself with anything in the house. Everything he owns, he's entrusted to my care. No one is greater in this house than I am. My master has withheld nothing from me except you because you're his wife. And here's, listen to this key. He says, how then could I do such a wicked thing and sin against God? His eyes are on God. I'm not just sinning against him. I'm sinning against God if I do this. I can't sin against God. And though she spoke to Joseph day after day, he refused to go to bed with her or even be with her. And on one day into, into the house, uh, one day went into the house to attend to his duties and none of the household servants were inside. She caught him by the cloak and said, come to bed with me. But he left his cloak in her hand and ran out of the house. Okay, so just, you know, interesting thought. If you see a man in his 20s running naked, it's not just a frat prank. It could be out of obedience to the Lord. <laughs> <laughs> and every frat boy here was like, thank you for that. <laughs> we can leverage that. And of course, you know what happens? She says, he tried to rape me. He's falsely uh, accused. And he's put into prison. And I mean, again, I mean, it's really, really hard to like describe how hard this must be. But you get all the way down into verse 20. It says, but while Joseph was there in prison, the Lord was with him. He showed him kindness, granted him favor in the eyes of the prison warden. So the warden put Joseph in charge of all those held in prison. He was made responsible for all that was done there. Mm -hmm. The warden paid no attention to anything under Joseph's care because the Lord was with Joseph and gave him success in whatever he did. He's been sold into slavery, betrayed. Now he's falsely accused. And he still continues to be faithful nonetheless. It's Again, it's very hard to get our minds around this. And very few of us will be accused in this manner to which we will go to prison. Very few. It happens. But my hunch is in a room this size, this would be a pretty rare experience for us. But I can tell you something that I think will happen to about everyone here is about everyone here will be falsely accused of something. At the very least, you will be accused and attacked in a way that you will be misunderstood at the very least. At the very least, someone will say something about you. They'll say, you know why he wants to be a pastor? He just, want, he just needs the attention. You know why she wants to be a worship leader? It's because she just wants everybody to, to pay attention to her. She, she, she has kind of a weak, you, you know about their marriage? Did you hear about their marriage? Do you know about their kids? These are things that will happen. Now, we should pause for a second and just say, some of those accusations will be accurate. And there are ways that God deals with our pride. There are ways that God deals with us where we want to feel important, where we want to be interesting, where we think that life will look better if somehow we get to stand on the stage and we get to talk about God, we really appreciate that. Listen, God is very good at humbling us. And one of the ways that God can humble you is by you feeling misunderstood. You feeling misrepresented. And this is really difficult because how do you discern? Like, how much do I go out of my way 
to make a case for myself? Like, how much do I go out of my way to say, you know, I've heard that somebody said this, but I need to clarify it, right? Anybody ever, you have Facebook, right? (laughs) And you watch somebody say something about you on Facebook because now everybody in your church has a media company, but there's no editor but themselves. So they can say whatever they want about you. They can say whatever they want about your church. How how are you going to do feeling misunderstood, being falsely accused? How long do you think you can wait around for someone to apologize? Some of you are like, I'm still waiting. (laughs) Or is it possible that one of the ways that God prepares us to be humble servants in this mission of his kingdom is he teaches us how to be unoffendable. He teaches us to be the kind of people that says, character is proven over time. And at any moment, somebody can misinterpret me. Someone can say a bad thing about me. Someone can build a little click around themselves and say whatever they want to say about me online or in our church. But you know what? I can trust God with that. And I choose not to be offended. Listen, this requires wisdom. But there's some of you right now that you're spending a lot of your time managing your reputation. And you're getting in the way of God managing it for you. And the more defensive you appear, the more that you demonstrate that you're kind of fragile and the more God has to kind of strengthen you. Five people laughed at that. (laughs) Five, five went, (laughs) 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 ooh. (laughs) But I think, I mean, people that I know that have grown through and live in the mission of God have learned how to be unoffendable. They can speak clearly about who they are and who they're not, what they will and won't do, and they let their life speak. Can you imagine Joseph being in prison? He has this mission. He has this call. He knows exactly who God's supposed to be. He's, in, he's a slave. He's like, that's okay. I'm going to be the best slave I can possibly be. Then he's accused. His character's put into question this way. I'm a rapist. That's wrong. That's false. I mean, I can imagine him wanting to turn to anybody who would listen. I, am not, I do not belong here. But he serves faithfully Even in that, and it says very clearly, God honors him in it. God honors him in it. So right now you're thinking, well, poor Joseph, he's probably through. No. Mm -mm. Danielle, you have another one. Mm -hmm. Because we haven't gotten everyone. (laughs) We see clearly that Joseph then moves into a space of forgottenness. There's a a story that I'm going to paraphrase for you where he is put into jail and he, again, gains so much favor in the jail that he is overseeing all the different prisoners and there is a baker and there is a cupbearer that he interacts with. And they come to him and they have dreams at the same exact time. They're separate dreams, but they come to him. And as he's interpreting these dreams, he's realizing that both of these men in three days, their lives are going to become very different. One is going to be released from jail and gain kind of prominence back in the position that he already had. And the other one would be released in three days for his death. And what he does, he looks at the one that's going to be released and gain prominence and continue on with his life. And this is what he says in chapter 40, verse 14. But when all goes well with you, remember me and show me kindness. This was his shot so that he could get out of jail and continue on with his life. Mention me to Pharaoh. Get me out of this prison. I was forcibly carried off from the land of the Hebrews. And even here, I have done nothing to deserve being put in a dungeon. And yet, 
The chief cupbearer, however, did not remember Joseph. He forgot all about him. He continued. He was excited. He moved on with his life. It takes two years before Joseph is remembered again. Two years goes by, sitting in a dungeon cell, reflecting on his life. I can't even imagine the way that he was trying to make sense of that door staying closed instead of being wide open so that he could walk free because he was so convinced of his innocence, right? But yet, two years, I can't imagine the reflection that he had about, you know, his younger years and the way that he reflected on his brothers selling him into slavery and the deep betrayal or the way that his father did not stand up for him. I can't imagine his level of despair that he had during those two years. It must have been torture because the people that he was asking for help and blessing and, and everything of, of the positivity, they instead forgot him. Have you ever had that moment where you've reached out to somebody and you've asked for help <laughs> and you've been like, please, I need help like right now. Like you are my leader. You are the person that's supposed to care about me. You are my friend. And it's been crickets, crickets. We all had that moment, haven't we? Where we struggle to like make meaning of that. We struggle to make sense of that. We try to figure out like, does that mean something about me? Or is it just because that person was busy? Have you ever had a prophetic word? Like a prophetic word that was given to you that you knew in your gut was from the Lord. It was a promise. It was a vision of your future. And you're like, yes, I'm going to hold on to that. I'm going to hold on to that. And it doesn't come to bear. You don't get that child that you were prophesied over. You don't have that big promotion that you really wanted and that somebody told you that maybe God would want that for you. You don't have, I could just go on and on and on and on. And you struggle in that liminal space. You struggle in that, that space of just going, but I don't know how to make sense of this. I don't know how to make sense of the character of God, the character of the person in front of me. This is a massive moment. And we can see like in the story that two years goes by before Pharaoh has a dream where all of a sudden the cupbearer has a memory of somebody helping him two years prior, grabs Joseph out of jail to be like there for the moment, save the day. Joseph has his moment. He has his moment where he looks at Pharaoh. He tells him the interpretation. Pharaoh looks at him and says, you are going to be promoted into prominence. He saves the land. He saves the land. He tells them, prepare. You have seven years of prosperity. Prepare because something's going to happen. And this is exactly the way that you need to actually lead and rule and that sort of thing. And we see the last stage that we're going to talk about in here, the last kind of test of character. So we move from betrayal. We move from being misunderstood. And then we move into being forgotten. And then the very last one that's going to hit some of you very hard, it would be he had to learn how to lead with the authority of God. He had to lead knowing that he had the authority of God on him. The weight of, the weight of that, it's weighty. It's weighty. He has his brothers walk into a room where he looks at them, and this is where we uh, get back into the scripture, and this is the last little bit where it says, jo and it's such a raw, like raw, 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 like a little bit of scripture. It says, Joseph, as the brothers walk in, could no longer control himself before all his attendants. He has like emotion, like bubbling up, and he cried out, have everybody leave my presence. So that there was nobody with Joseph before he was made known to his brothers, and he wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard him and the Pharaoh's household heard about it. Joseph looked at his brothers. He said, I'm Joseph. Is my father still living? But his brothers were not even able to answer him because they were so terrified at his presence. I bet they were. Yes. So then Joseph looked at his brothers, come close to me. And when they had done so, he said, I'm your brother, Joseph, the one you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed. Do not be angry with yourself for selling me here, which is such a tender moment There's that he's actually again. attending to their emotions in the midst of having something very dramatic happen to him. Read that verse again. For now, do not be distressed and do not be angry with yourselves for selling me here. Because it was to save lives 
that God sent you ahead, or me ahead of you, it was to save lives. For two years now, there's been famine in the land. And for the next five years, there's gonna be no plowing, no reaping, but God sent me ahead of you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. I can't imagine the work that he had to do to get to this moment. That God sent him. That God sent him. God did this. That he made sense of all the betrayals and all the forgottenness and all of that, that he made sense of it. That God looked at him and said, this all matters. I'm not going to waste a bit of your pain. It matters for moments like this that you can stand in a moment, you can give glory to God, and you can stand in peace, be able to offer comfort and compassion to the people that betrayed you. I mean, come on. This moment of strength is something to be admired. And I believe that there's people in this room that you are wrestling with this right now. Yeah. Because you are walking through and you've walked through these really painful moments and you're looking and going, but doesn't life have to be like really hard, like all the time? It could be that God is actually giving you the favor of authority to be able to stand in moments like right now, like right now and go, God did something in me. He formed something inside me. That scaffolding that we know that we have to have in our inner life, that scaffolding was fused together in these like really bad moments. These moments where I didn't think I was gonna make it. I was anxious and I was depressed and I was despairing and I was giving up. It fused together to be able to hold the weight of God's authority. And I'll tell you what, if he would have shrunken back in that moment, he would have been sinning. He would have been sinning because that is testimony to what God did in his life. There are people in this room right now that you need to stand in the weight of authority that God has given you. Do not be afraid. Be courageous and stand in that moment. Amen? Bless to forgive. Okay. We're going to briefly wrap up with this last third, okay? Because we are not forgetting how important this last third is. This last third is loosening the grip. Have you ever talked to anybody in the last third of life that's behaving like they are in the second third? They are asking questions of identity that they should have figured out even in the first third. They are asking questions of calling that they should have figured out in that second third. They're asking questions of meaning. There is something that you let go in that last third. We came across a book that has been very meaningful in these last, I mean, few weeks that we want to re re recommend to you. You snap a picture of this like right now. It is Paul Zoll, and he wrote a book called Peace in the Last Third of Life. He speaks meaning in a way that, honestly, there is not a lot written about this last third, and we need to understand understand how important it is, that it is not something that we just drift off and die. And I, and I want to recommend, it says peace, a handbook peace. for hope for boomers, but if mm -hmm. you're, even if you're not a boomer, you should read this. Yes, exactly. Because you got some around. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and this helpful. guy, I'm going to read you a, a brief little thing and then we're going to wrap up. This is what he says. What also happens in this last third of life is that one's personal attachments are one by one like your fingers on a metal pipe that is keeping you from falling into the current a hundred yards below, dislodged whether you like it or not. It is not a threat to say that what, what I'm about ready to say. It is an empirical fact. Your hearing gets worse. Costco hearing aids. Your eyesight gets worse. Walgreens reading glasses, which you like misplace like every three days. Your physical endurance, not, it's, gonna, it's gonna get better, okay? Your physical endurance gets cut in half or worse. Your physical potency Okay, I'm just, this is a man writing this. Okay, Do you want me to read this, this part? Is, your no, physical no, 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 potency, no, 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 okay. no, no, if you're your a man, physical, becomes, no, no, your be, physical, wait, wait, let me, let me, beca becomes chancy, <laughs> parentheses, blue pills. Okay, blue pills, okay. Your hair 
changes colors if you have any hair left anyway. Dye from, uh, whatever. Okay, your skin gets blotches and your muscles it gets it gets, get yeah, stringy. Right. Botox, maybe? I don't know. He's, he writes really funny. I can go on and on. It's not as if you can now choose to live, to exist as you did in the second half of life. Your body affords you no choice. We were at church recently, this is the author, at a really excellent uh, like parish near where we live most of the year. I asked my wife, because I honestly didn't know what percentage of the women here at the service right now dye their hair, would you say? She answered about 80%. This was news to me because I know nothing. I would have guessed maybe 30%. Mary said 80. I guess there's more. It gets better. Men lose their career. Men and women were the vineyard. Okay, men and women lose their careers. What I'm saying here concerning men and women in this last third of life is not narrative. It is not a story being made up. It is empirical observation from many years in parish ministry. The biggest block to peace and hope in the last third of life, the biggest block is unresolved, unhealed experiences of suffering from a person's past, usually the distant past, which might seem to hold on or which seem to hold on to you when all or most other attachment or buoys even are gone. The key, therefore, to peace and hope as the accompaniment, indeed the outcome of a person's physical life and journey is the resolution of unhealed, unresolved pain from the distant past. Take us home. Wow. So the basic argument Paul makes in this argument, I think we can see throughout church history, is that the final third of life is the power and the great privilege of giving away, of blessing. And uh, I'll read a passage that isn't in Genesis, but it relates to the main character of our talk tonight being Joseph. It's from Hebrews eleven twenty one. It's a powerful picture. It's a beautiful picture. The writer of Hebrews says this, by faith Jacob, when he was dying, blessed each of Joseph's son and worship as he leaned on the top of his staff. Isn't that a beautiful image? Jacob, as he's dying, says, blessed his sons and Joseph's sons and he worshiped leaning on his staff. That was him dying. I cannot describe from at least the stage I'm in the value in my life of men and women in this room speaking blessing into my life. It would be impossible for me to describe how valuable it is. As you are letting go a bit, can I beg you as your hands open to sit and bless those who are taking it the next mile? And I mean it. I mean actually bless them. You like lay hands on them. You speak blessing toward them. And I know that this feels like, ah, eh, is that really a thing? It's a really important thing. It's really important. I can remember uh, there's a pastor that kind of mentored us. This is all finished, a guy named Greg Thompson. And we were going through a really hard time in our church plan. Actually, it felt like we should just quit, you know, because there was a lot of things going wrong, but it was also really internal things. It was personal stuff, like in our own lives and our marriage and trying to figure out how to raise small kids and do all the stuff we were doing. It was a mess. It's a mess. I remember sitting with him and we were just laying it all out. And this and this and this and this and this. And so said, what do we do? And I'll never forget. He just leaned forward and said, you're going to be fine. The first thing that did was make me angry because mm-hmm. I was like, I'm asking, and he goes, no, no, listen to me. You're going to be fine. Mm-hmm. And I bet he said it 20 times in a row. Mm-hmm. And then he finally said, you know why I know you're going to be fine? Because I've done it. People like me have done this. You can do it because we did it. We found a way through. There is a way through, Jay. You can do it. You can do it. You're not alone. I'm here. We're praying for you. I'll sit with you as many times as you need to hear me say it. You can do this. You can do this. Can I just say, I I don't know if there's a way to describe how important and powerful that is. Mm -hmm. To look at younger leaders when they're like, oh my gosh, and we can't get the building funded. And listen, when you're in that last third of life, one of the things he says is that second third suddenly becomes less interesting. You're like, building campaign, huh? It'll be fine. 
Now listen, listen to what just happened, okay? There's two kinds of laughs that just happened. Two kinds. There's those in the last third that are like, of course. Yeah. And there was those yeah. in the second that were like, no, oh, no, it's not going to be fine. You understand what this is? Those people have to talk. And listen to me, it's not about your great advice, though I'm sure you have great advice. Bless and worship. Bless and worship. That picture of Jacob is so powerful. He's leaning on his staff, worshiping. And listen, you know Jacob's story. It did not go the way he wanted it to go. He made a lot of mistakes and a lot went wrong, but there he is at the end of his life and he's looking at his sons, who he just figured out, pretended that they murdered. They sold one of them into slavery. Just finds this out, like, this is new information. This has not gone exactly the way he wanted it to go. But he blesses, and he worships. He blesses, and he worships. Listen, for, for me, I'm begging you. If you're in that final third, can you please bless and worship? Your digni- if your dignity is still on the line, get the healing and the help that you need. Yes. Because that first third comes up with vengeance. All those betrayals you didn't deal with, it's coming. All that pain from the past, it comes and it blocks you as you're losing your grit. It blocks you from truly blessing and truly worshiping. Deal with your stuff, truly worship, and truly bless. And the hope for our movement is that we're Mm multi-generational as long as the Lord would tarry. (laughs) But we need to be multi-generational. And this is a huge moment in the life of our movement. For those who are in that final third, who's in their final third? Who, Who crossed over into that line to bless and to worship? Stay in the room. Stay in the room and bless and worship. Can you do that? Can you make that commitment and deal with your stuff? Your dignity is not on the line. If you didn't figure it out by now, learn how to bless and worship. (laughs) Amen? Amen. Can we stand together? Let's stand. We imagine that um, this ministry time, um, it's going to be hot. I mean, honestly, I mean, seriously, like, like I can't imagine that there's a single person in the room that can't quite identify what the Lord is speaking to them. But we do have a few different, a few different way. people that people that? groups that we want to bring up front as we worship um, and, and, uh, and as we pray for each other, okay? So what I wanna do, I wanna start off with this last group that Jay just ended with, this last third. Um, I'm not gonna be fancy here. I think that there's people here that you are recognizing your unresolved pain, your unresolved issues are preventing you from actually loosening the grip. Like it is impossible, you are asking the questions that are not appropriate for your stage of life. And quite honestly, I would want to say to you really clearly right now that the Lord's inviting you into different questions. He's inviting you into much richer and beautiful things. And, and, And could we pray for you tonight that you could make that transition? that you could just find something kind of loosed inside of you that we could make that transition, could we pray for you tonight? Because I believe that the Lord can do that deep kind of like letting go, that he can companion with you along that process. And I also want that first third, those who are younger are like, I don't really have a big vision and I'm, I'm under 30, I don't really know, I don't know. Somebody made me be here. <laughs> or I'm just doing the next thing. Listen, life is but a mist, it goes so fast. Yeah. You know, like join in with what God is doing in the world and you will never regret it. You just won't. It's worth it. And so I think it would be good for us to minister to those folks uh, really intentionally. So, I I mean, I want to say anyone under 30, but I know that's the kind of the thing we do. But there's some of you that are like, I really don't know what the call is. Or more clearly, you have a big dream and you're just not saying it. You're not talking about it. Because you're like, this could be naive. This is kind of silly. I mean, could I really plant a church? Could I really? 
do this? I don't think I could do this, but why don't we just ask the Lord that? And let's bless you and ask the Holy Spirit to speak to you. Some of you are called to plant churches in the room. And then there's the two thirds that are like all of us. And you're going, I know the test that's in front of me and I may or may not be passing it, but we wanna minister that God would give you mercy and healing in those things. So why don't you just flood up here right now? Come on up. Let's come up. Any of those three. And I just wanna say, as we invite our prayer ministry, if, if, if you feel like I have something to give right now, we're gonna invite you to come forward also. I had a very, very clear sense that we need to be very attentive to, um, I don't know how to say that, uh, like we need very attentive that there could be some things loosed inside of people that we need to proclaim freedom over them. So Amen. just be discerning in that, that it might not just be a, a gentle prayer, but it could be a, we're gonna stand with you and do battle right now with you because you've given yourself over to something or something's kind of attached onto you that is gonna be loosed for you tonight. Does that make sense, you guys? So like freedom in the name of Jesus. I also had another very clear word that I believe that there are people here that you live so heavily with an imposter oh, syndrome. Sure. Like imposter, like that, that phrase is actually in your mind that it is impossible for you to stay present in a room because you're so consumed with that. You think you're a fraud. Could we pray for you tonight that that is banished from you, that you do yeah. not deal with that anymore? Like, I think that that needs to be gone from the way that you're thinking so and feeling. We're gonna so need a lot of people to minister. So if you just look, if you, could you come up and begin to pray with folks? Or if someone came to the room tonight, they are fair game. You can spin. <laughs> Just spin, they don't have to come up here. You can just spin and say, I think the Lord wants to speak to you. Could I pray for you? And let's just, let's have a release of the prophetic. And can we just give each other grace? If you're wrong, later, you can say that person was crazy. It's fine. It's fine, this is a room to, to risk is my point. So risk in faith, minister to one another. Look around, honestly, spin around. If you're just sitting in your chairs, and ask the Holy Spirit, but we need a lot of people up here to pray, and then we'll release you here in just a bit.